You're listening to Artistic Finance, show 69. In this episode, we pick up where we left off from episode one of this two-part series. If you haven't already listened to part one, I recommend you go back to last week's episode and listen to that first before you start this one. I hope you enjoyed part one of this two-part series as much as I did. Let's jump right into part two now. You're listening to Artistic Finance Podcast, where your host, Ethan Steimel, interviews successful artists, leaders, and investors to help educate and inspire artists to grow their wealth. On this show before, we've talked about, you know, should you get somebody to do your taxes, to file your taxes for you, or should you not? And as an artist, I really strongly encourage people to get someone to file your taxes because they know the rules and they know how to save you money. And while, yes, you technically can do them yourselves with um, online tax, TurboTax, you might fill out something wrong or there's some advantage that an accountant is going to just automatically do for you because they know how it works. And they're going to probably save you the amount of money that you're going to pay them for doing their taxes. And it's the same thing like you just said with a financial advisor is I remember in our first meeting, somebody said tax harvesting. Mm -hmm. I sort of know the idea, don't really know how to do it, but that was one of those things where it's like the financial advisor. And I don't, as far as I know, you guys have not taxed harvest for us. We don't really fit that mold, but it, it, you guys know the rules and you know how to do what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know how to do that or what that is. That's something already that we never would have even considered. Well, it sounds like it's time for our next meeting, Ethan, because we certainly have been doing tax loss harvesting and would love <laughs> to explain how that has worked for you and how that has saved you money on your taxes. You want me to talk through that? Maybe that will be helpful for the listeners, just even to know what that is and think of, you know, one of the advantages of working with an advisor or professional money manager is that they can do that for you versus having to go in and do that for yourself. <laughs> I feel so honored that we have been tax loss harvested. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, go ahead and explain that. <laughs> you know, I try to cut out as much of the jargon as possible and make it as easy to understand for clients when they're working with you. And I think, again, you asked what are some of the you know good characteristics of a great advisor. That's one of those types of things that if you can put it in easy to understand terms for clients and not just inundate them with things that are way over their head, I think people just enjoy that, whether it's financial advice or medical advice, really any <laughs> advice that you're getting. But back to tax loss harvesting here. So now you buy one individual stock. Let's call it Coke here. Wait, time out, time out. We're, this is an artist podcast, so you have to say like Disney or MGM. <laughs> okay, got it. Yeah, let's do Disney then. So you've bought one share of Disney at $10 per share. You can't wait for it to go up, but it is January 2020 and the pandemic has hit next few months and Disney is down 20%. So that stock that you paid $10 for is now down 20% at $8 per share. Let's say that we still wanted exposure in your portfolio to something in the entertainment sector that was going to really follow closely to Disney's performance, but wasn't exactly the same. So let's call it MGM in your example here. You have sold your Disney shares then when you tax lust harvest that you bought at 10, sold at eight. So you have a $2 capital loss at that point but you immediately turn around and take that same $8 and buy shares of MGM at that point. And we fast forward again, six months, stock markets recovered, and those MGM shares are up to, say, $12 a share, and you have a gain and a profit. That's great. You were able to participate in the upside of the entertainment industry roaring back, but you still have a $2 tax loss from that sale of Disney. So a couple of big benefits that you can use that tax loss for. You could either use that to offset capital gains tax on a future sale. So let's say that you sold that MGM stock at the $12 per share that you bought at eight and you had a $4 profit. Instead of having to pay taxes on that $4 profit, you could use that $2 loss to offset it and you would then only have $2 worth of a gain that you have a profit on. So you can use those capital losses to offset future capital gains, but not only in the same year, but you can also carry forward those losses indefinitely. So in any future year, if you had gains, you could take that loss that you had and offset future gains. Another big benefit too is up to $3,000 per year. 
can be deducted off of your income if you have losses. So, you know, that's step one is you take that loss, see if it offsets any capital gains that are out there. You can also use it to offset your income. And if you had more than $3,000, let's say it was $5,000 of losses, you'd have another $2,000 that you could use in the future to offset any other future gains or continue to subtract that $3,000 per year off your taxes. So we're getting to the weeds here. It's getting complicated, but that's why you have the advisor, right? Of someone who knows the ins and outs of using that to your benefit and working closely with your accountant to make sure that you're enjoying all of the perks from the tax loss harvesting that's going on. Amazing. Um, I want to get back to our first meeting. So in, in prep for this show, I went back and saw that you guys had sent us notes after our first meeting, but I'm just sharing them so that people know, I guess, what a financial advisor maybe is looking at in their clients. So the, the notes you sent us says, you're 28, Nicole is 27, you have no children and there are no plans in the immediate future, though you guys do continue to ask us that. Yeah, back to that children question. You Every said. time, jeez Louise. Uh, in Nicole, this is Nicole's salary, this is Ethan's salary, which of course as a freelancer is you know wildly fluctuating. Mm -hmm. here, here are your assets and you have your retirement accounts, which are untaxed, and then you have your taxed accounts, and then here's what you have in your checkings and savings accounts. Th those are all the notes you took on us. Yeah, and you know it's funny prepping for this podcast. I went through, and we have you now all the notes from not only just that meeting, but each interaction that we've had with you as tracked, which you know, is really helpful to have an advisor that has that type of system that is you know aware of all the past meetings that they've had with their clients, so they can you know go back and reference those notes, see what was talked about, see the type of advice that was given for when that comes up in future conversations. So and I think as you can see from that, there was you know some that was quantitative information. We were trying to get a sense of you know, what you were making. You know, we had shared with you that expense worksheet to see what you were saving afterwards, as well as you know trying to find out what it was that you wanted that money doing for you. So I think you guys can give yourself a pat on the back, you know, looking through from the beginning of our relationship very early on, you guys did start doing that automatic investment plan, which has really worked out for you since you know, we've seen almost nothing but positive markets since the time that you started investing with us. And you also increased that automatic investment over time, which we love to see for clients. So, you know, as you increased your earnings and had more of the capacity to save, instead of just having that money go into a checking account you added more to your investment accounts to have that work for you. Now, another thing that I will give you credit for, and this is extremely difficult to do, worked out for you in this situation and doesn't always do that. But you know, a lot of times if the market's down, as much as it was down at this time, you were three days off from calling the market bottom of adding additional money to your account. Back in 2020, you called me up. You said, you know, is this a good time to put money into the market? We're really low right now. Sure enough, you know, you did put money in and you know, the bottom of the market was March 23rd. I think your addition was on the 26th when I checked the notes. And again, that's seen a, a nice little pop and increase since we have seen that recovery. Okay, I just I, I have to go back and replay that part because a certified financial planner just said Ethan, <laughs> Ethan Steimel of Artistic Finance Podcast was three days off from calling the market bottom in 2020. Did everybody hear that? That's funny. We don't endorse market timing, ended up working out here. But look, anytime there is a significant pullback like that, it is a good time to talk to clients and get a sense of, you know, do they have extra money sitting around that isn't earning anything right now sitting in bank accounts because interest rates are so low. And would it be a good opportunity if you've been saving money, you haven't been spending as much going out because everything shut down during the pandemic? We've found that a ton over the last year is a lot of the clients that we work with have just accumulated really high amounts of cash just from their spending going down and not being able to do a lot of the things that they typically had enjoyed spending money on that that gives them a great capacity to save more either in a lump sum at one point or you know increase those ongoing investments that we spoke about. And, and lest anyone think I have any sort of wiseness in money, I do not. <laughs> well, maybe after this podcast now, right? Yeah, maybe. I'm, I'm learning so much, right? I know about tax loss harvesting now. <laughs> but but that situation was purely coincidental in the sense of Nicole and I, we were, we were saving up and then 
all my work disappeared in a week. I mean, I had a year's worth of work lined up and live events started canceling and I lost every single job for the next year and a half. Well, hopefully your advisor had prompted you to have a great emergency fund for those exact situations. But as we talk <laughs> about some of those things for artists to consider, you know, when they're thinking about their own finances, we'll, we'll certainly talk a little bit more about having that cash cushion for exact situations like that. Exactly, like 2020. And what I say is 2020, yeah, it was COVID, it was an anomaly. But anomalies are expected. And it just happened to be a good time. <laughs> <laughs> I also just want to talk about, I don't know why I'm hammering this home that Nicole and I don't like for meetings. But when you went back to look at our, you know, all the information you had on us, do you know how many meetings we've had in the last five years? Yeah, I, I started to add them up. So we'd actually started on a quarterly schedule way back when. And you know, I've taken the foot off the pedal at that point. And you know, that's important to ask. And I think a great question for both the advisor and the client to be on the same page on is what feels right for you. For some people, it is quarterly. Some people just do one big annual check-in along the way. And I don't think there's a perfect answer for that. And some years are going to be a lot more complex. Let's say there is a job change or you have a kid or you know things that prompt more of the financial planning or other years that are just more routine and you're saving, humming along, and you don't necessarily need that advice. So I don't have the exact number. I'll have to follow up with you, you know, how many meetings that was, but we did definitely decrease the frequency and, you know, moved a little bit closer to a semi-annual or annual check-in with little things that came up along the way. You know, we're always only a phone call or an email away. So even if you do have that type of setup with an advisor where those formal meetings are more scheduled and structured, you know, hopefully you're working with an advisor that is accessible and has really good response times to still get back to you on any of those more one-off questions or situations that might come up. And I do think the the quarterly check-ins was good, but I think it was the second quarterly check-in. We realized Ethan has to find time in his schedule. Nicole has to try, find time and Matt Queller has to find time. We all have to agree on a time and then meet. And then if you're doing quarterly meetings, nothing changes. So I think we jumped to yearly. We just sort of grew into, we'll call you when there's something going on and you can call us when there's something going on. So we really don't have the meeting scheduled, which is perfectly fine for us. <laughs> right. And again, that's why, you know, it's all customized based on the individual and you want to make sure that you're aligning with, you know, what it is that they hired you for and the reasons that they wanted to work with you in the first place. You talked a little bit about fees for a financial advisor. Do you want to talk more about that? What are the different types of fees? Yeah, I can touch on a little bit and yeah, different things to pay attention to. So Expense ratios, that's a word that gets thrown around a lot by advisors, and that may sound like a foreign concept to a lot of the listeners here. Now, you can go out and buy an individual stock. We'll go back to Disney, an example, and if you don't pay a commission for that, there's no ongoing fees to own it because it's just that one investment. But let's say that you wanted to own a exchange-traded fund or a mutual fund that was just focused on growth-oriented tech companies. So you could go out and buy one share of that mutual fund or exchange traded fund. And for that one purchase, you could get exposure to a hundred different companies where there's a manager who's selecting which type of tech companies we want to have in that portfolio and which ones we think are going to be the best performers. So to get access to all of that, now I like to akin it to buying the shopping cart when you're going in the grocery instead of buying out each individual item out of the shelf. So you would have to go out and pay for, say, 100 different companies. It would cost a lot more to acquire all of those versus just getting them in that packaged form. But to do that, there is a cost that comes along with the ownership of that mutual fund or the exchange traded fund. So that expense ratio, it's not anything also that you see on your statement like an advisory fee or a transaction fee but it's the cost of owning the investment that affects the performance. So let's say that over time, those tech companies that year, they were up a collective 11%, but your expenses for owning that investment were 1% as the expense ratio. You as the investor would only have a 10% return that you would see on your statement. So what you have as the investor is the net of fees after factoring in the performance and what it costs to run that fund. So the expertise to select the right investments, the regulatory costs for printing out all the prospectuses and sending that to you, the salaries of the people that are running the funds. 
And they'll actually document that out for you if you did want to read about all of that in the prospectus of what all of those costs break down to. But just one of those important things to know about and all else being equal, if you could get a 10% return for owning an investment that only costs 0.25% or that same 10% investment costs 1%, you want to have cheap investment costs. And this is something that Vanguard was all about. And with the invention of the index fund, now one of the most attractive qualities of owning that is they're really low cost and they let you capture as much of that market return, taking it home yourself. And that helps you grow and compound your money. There's some really great calculators are out there that will show you, you know, over a 10 or 20 or 30 year period, what even just a tiny difference in fees can do to that end balance that you have with, again, the lower fees getting you to that much higher balance down the road. So that's expense ratios. Trading costs are pretty straightforward. Typically now for stocks across most companies, it's free to trade. For ETFs and mutual funds, probably anywhere between $7 to $20 for those. Depending on your advisor, the strategy that's there, that shouldn't be too high of a cost ongoing per year. Again, also depends on the balance of the accounts. You can decide to work on a couple of those different fee structures that we had, whether it's a one-time engagement where you're paying an upfront planning fee, an hourly subscription fee that you pay, or that percentage of the assets that are being managed. So a lot of different options that are out there, and you know, there is becoming a lot more choice for an investor to decide which one's going to be the best fit for me based on what my needs are. We, when we went with you initially, it was that there was no fees. And it was just the expense ratios that were in the funds was was the fees we were paying. And then last year, early last year, we switched to 1% of our assets being managed is the fee that we're paying you. Is that right? Yes. So our company had mutual funds that were run in-house. So because we were getting paid on the expenses from that mutual fund that was run in-house, that's why there wasn't the advisory fee based on the setup that you had. So there were all the reasons that that fund was created in the past based on the style of investing that it was focused on, which was quantitative factor-based. So targeting certain characteristics of companies that we felt would outperform over time based on research. Now there were a lot of other options that were available in the marketplace that weren't available years ago when those mutual funds were created that allowed us to leverage those at lower costs. But then that's where the advisory fee did come in because we were no longer using the in-house mutual funds as part of the strategy. And I, I hate monthly subscriptions. That's like my arch nemesis of existence. But I actually think I, I'm a fan of that, I think, when it comes to financial advisors. So I'll be interested to see how that works out. Yeah. And look, a lot of younger clients, again, are really familiar with that method just from all the different subscriptions that they have between their Netflix and their Spotify account. And it allows them to get access to you know much needed advice that's out there for people who may you know, have a minimum where they traditionally would have been underserved or you know, not even able to access that advice in the first place. And I can't help but mention that if anyone's looking for a monthly subscription, uh, artistic Finance does have a Patreon at patreon.com slash artistic finance. Just if you want to add another monthly subscription into your life. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Well, after this podcast, they should really get on board. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we have Matt Queller as a guest, and he is killing it with all this like <laughs> actual knowledge, not from an artist, but from a real <laughs> financial person. <laughs> um, so I want to get into what actually is a financial plan. But before we even get to it, like still, you know, seeing who needs an advisor, if somebody does their prep for a meeting with an advisor and they look at their budget, how does the budget play into that, especially with artists? If we do our budget and we see that, oh, there's no way we can be saving, should we just immediately think, okay, we're not going to make a financial plan or we're not going to have that meeting with the financial advisor? Yeah. And look, I have a lot of artists that are clients. So, you know, this is near and dear to me of helping them through what that you know exact solution might look like to the problem of the unsteady cash flows and you know not knowing when the next contract is going to come in. So I think in those situations a lot of times it's even more valuable to think through you know the time frame and dollar amounts for what those projects might be down the road. So you know if you do have a really big year or your earnings are going to be much higher and you know well this project's going to be done and I get paid out in say November of 2022 when this is coming in, making sure that you have a plan for those dollars and doing that beforehand can be really helpful of putting that together. So whether that's the 
right type of account structure that you might save in to potentially offset some of that income from different types of retirement accounts that are available, whether that's, you know, thinking through how much cash you would need to have in the bank before that income comes in to sustain yourself based on what your expenses are. There's a lot of different considerations that you can start thinking through, even if that money hasn't come in yet to really try to put some numbers and timing behind what might be coming in and what you might do if that does play out. Okay. So then what is a financial plan? Because that's what you're making, right, for your clients? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, it really starts with that net worth. So defining, you know, what your situation is today. So what are the you know balances and all the different types of accounts and you know any of the liabilities that are out there. And also putting together that statement of cash flows. So looking at what earnings are coming in or income sources, whether that's just salary, contract work, maybe rental income in your situation as we talk through that. And then what's the money going out? That will then give you the number of what you could potentially save or put towards those goals. And then it is defining not just the name of what you're saving for, like buying a home or saving for retirement, but saying in that plan, here's what we project the home to cost. Here's what I might be saving. For that home, here's the type of account that I'm doing it in. Here's how this type of account should be structured in terms of how aggressive or how conservative it is to have a rate of return based on the amount that I'm saving. That's going to allow me to get to the amount that I need by the time that I would like to do that. So, you know, I'm saving for a home that's in five years in your financial plan. That would say, here's how much I'm saving each month, the account that I'm doing it in. And am I likely to get to that amount that I need for the down payment? Or part of the plan might be the advisor coming back and saying, you're only saving $500 a month. If you want to get to the 100,000 you need for your down payment and be successful with that goal based on our assumed rate of return there, you need to save closer to 750 or $1,000. So the financial plan also, it is a snapshot in time, but I always like to say it's written in pencil. It's something that should be reviewed and revisited regularly as goals change, earnings change, expenses change to update it over time and make sure that you do have that accountability of how you're tracking towards those goals and what that plan looks like for you at that point in time. Amazing. And you brought up a a good point about a net worth. The one thing that you guys do after every one of our meetings is send us a net worth snapshot. You guys gleaned that roughly from the budget. But that also might be another thing to take with you to a meeting with a financial advisor is if you have a net worth, which again is also a very simple thing to put together. But that's different from the monthly budget, your cash flow statement of what's coming in, what's coming out. Your net worth is where do you stand just overall everything. We did an Instagram live with Tony Johnson, who's a costume shop manager, and he walked us through how to calculate his net worth and how he does it because he tracks it. His net worth is negative. Do you have any clients that have negative net worth? Yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, I'd say few and far between, right? Because most of our clients we work with on um, assets under management basis. So they do need some investments for us to manage. But we've also had more of those one-time, one-off engagements where it might just be a consultation or, you know, it's a conversation with, say, a client's you know, daughter or client's granddaughter who's just getting started out and we're doing as a favor or as part of the included services for that family member is we'll talk to other, you know, family members. But in those circumstances, it's really important, even if you are at a negative net worth, to have a plan in place of, you know, digging yourself out of that of are you, you know, paying back the right type of debt first? You know, it's taking a look at what interest rates might be, what your capacity is to save, and at least knowing where you stand. A lot of people, you know, put their head in the sand, run away from it or say, you know, I'll never get out of debt. But, you know, there's a lot of different strategies that you can put in place, whether that's, you know, paying down the highest interest rate first or, you know, paying the one with the lowest balance first to make it feel like you're making progress to ultimately help turn them around from that negative net worth over to the positive side. And once we have our financial plan, whether we went with an advisor or maybe we just decided on our on our own, once we have that financial foundation for ourselves, how do we then pick the right investments to to use going forward? Yeah, that's another good question. And I think also differs depending on if you're going to be going off and doing this on your own and doing all of the research involved to building and managing a portfolio on an ongoing basis, 
or that is something that you delegate out to the professional money manager, whether that's your advisor or someone else that the advisor is using. So one of the first things to look at is, you know, what asset class do I want to be invested in? And that's really going to depend on what the length of time is that you're investing for, how comfortable you are with fluctuations, and what your expected rate of return is going to be for those dollars. So, you know, let's use our circumstances as an example. And, you know, maybe a lot of your listeners who are, you know, in their, you know, beginning aspects of their career, maybe young 30s, saving for retirement and thinking about which investment should I select. For someone our age who has a long length of time in between now and retirement, is okay with fluctuations along the way and knowing that things are going to go up and down in between now and retirement, stocks as an asset class versus things like bonds or cash have the highest expected return over that period of time for an investor. So the longer the period of time, typically that's going to be stocks that make the most sense for that long-term appreciation versus, you know, back to my situation, saving for a home or a down payment. Let's say that that's, you know, a month away or six months away. You don't want to have stock-based investments for that type of goal that's over such a short period of time because of, you know, the exact situation like March 2020, where if that's down 30%, there goes my down payment of the money that I needed. I'd rather have that in more safe or stable-based investments. So that's on the asset class side. And then there's a lot of tools that are out there too to say, okay, once I decide on stocks, what should I look for next, right? So expenses are one of the considerations. Diversification, again, of being spread out amongst different size companies, different geographies is important to look at. And then there's also a lot of ranking systems that are out there that will show you historical returns, total dollar amounts that are invested in the funds. You can see if there's a lot of other people that also have trusted their money with the manager to take a look. So one of the big companies that's out there is called Morningstar, and they'll come out with rankings and different stars for investments based on their historical performance. But you also want to make sure that, again, it goes back to that original focus that I looked at of stocks versus bonds versus cash of which asset class should you be invested in based on the timing of your goal and your comfort level with those fluctuations. Amazing. Just a plug. So there's a website I use. Where did I write that down? So I use finra.org when I'm looking at expense ratios. They have You can just go finra.org slash fund analyzer. And I type in the fund and then it just gives you how much expense ratio you're paying out. Yeah, there's a great tool on there. And, you know, I would say while we're talking about what's available to look into not only investments, but when you're choosing the advisor and making that decision, there's another one that's run by FINRA, which is a regulatory authority for financial advisors in the finance industry. There's one called Broker Check. So I definitely recommend every you know prospective client who's thinking about hiring it advisor search their advisors or advisors to be name on broker check and that'll show you a history of the firms that they've been registered at whether they have any complaints about them or you know regulatory rules that they've broken so again an advisor could say oh i have a squeaky clean record but this website is going to show you whether or not they can really back that up and we'll tell you because we have to disclose everything and it's an extremely regulated industry for good reason, whether or not they're telling the truth. I'm going to look up Gerstein Fisher right now on broker check. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you can look up both the firm and you can also look up the individual, but it is more so for broker check, the individual that you would search by the individual's name. Individual being Matt Queller. Right. Hey, your middle name is Evan. Oh, yeah, you got it. I'm on broker check right now. Aired that up. <laughs> Three exams passed, 52 state licenses, nine years experience, five firms. Okay, okay. All right, I'm going to look into you later. <laughs> there you go. Man, I should have done that before our first meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Again, back to that checklist of uh, you know, helping people prepare as best as possible. <laughs> okay. Um, when I was in college, I got a subscription to Money Magazine. I read it, and it said, oh, if you start saving $50 a week at age 18, you can have a million dollars by the time you retire. And at the time I read that I was, let's say, 21, and I panicked. And I said, <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> I, I have three years to make up for if I want to have a million dollars. So I immediately opened a, up a Roth IRA, and I started saving. 
also in Money Magazine, it says, oh, here are the steps you need to take to be financially, have a good foundation. And it says, first thing, have an emergency fund. And I was in college. I had no money. At the time, I thought six to $9,000 was what I would need for an emergency fund to last me for three to six months. I said to myself, like, there's no way I'm ever going to be able to save up $6,000. That's insane. So I'm just going to open up my Roth IRA and start saving for my future, knowing that I don't have the emergency fund. So that was what I did for myself. And I'm just wondering if there are other people thinking that, what would you say to, to people thinking, oh, start the Roth IRA, start saving for retirement, or get your emergency fund first? Where do you, where do you land on that? Yeah, look, I mean... There's the textbook advice that we give, but we also recognize as advisors that the clients we work with are human beings and they're going to make their own decisions too, right? So it's finding that balance also between here's the best advice, but also here's the advice that we think you'll be able to follow. Because in my mind, the advice is worthless if it just goes in one ear and out the other for the client. So I do think having some cash, maybe not that six month amount, but having that you know three month baseline or even having you know, some type of emergency fund outside of cash in the bank. And when I say that, it's, you know, with the quotations there that you can't see for the podcast. But, you know, if you could have fallen back and maybe your parents would have helped you out if you really, you know, came on to hard times or there were other things that you might have been able to sell off and liquidate for cash on eBay if you needed to come up with some medical expense money that you could have had access to. So it's definitely important. But I do think there's a huge benefit to starting a tax advantaged account like the Roth IRA as early as possible, as soon as you have those earnings to be able to do that. And so for all the listeners out there, a Roth IRA is a type of retirement account. If you're under 50, you can put $6,000 in per year as long as you've made at least $6,000. These are dollars that are considered after tax money or money that you've already paid tax on. So think of dollars that are already sitting in your bank account that you got from your paycheck where you don't get a tax deduction for the dollars that are going in there. But the idea is as long as you've had it for at least five years and you take that money out down the road, typically after 60, so you don't have a penalty, that you're never going to have to pay taxes on either your contributions or any of the earnings that you've had out of that Roth IRA. So really powerful, you know, let's say that Ethan Steimel decided to put in $5,000 at that point right out of school, and that grew to 100000 by the time he retired. That $95,000 profit was just in a brokerage account, back to your lingo before. You would have had to pay capital gains tax on that 95000 but because it was in a Roth IRA and it grew that much, just based on the structure of the account and the rules around that, that whole $100,000 you could take out tax-free penalty free for retirement spending down the road. Now one more caveat that I'll you know have it come back full circle to well, did Ethan Stein make the right decision back in the day? You can always take out contributions, so money that you've put into a Roth IRA tax free and penalty free at any time. So let's say an emergency did come up and your you know five thousand dollars you put in there was ten thousand dollars, you could have still taken out your original five thousand dollars tax free penalty free if something did come up. So if someone's thinking, you know, I don't I don't necessarily have the full emergency fund built up yet, but I want to start saving a little bit. I think there is some merit of finding that middle ground and get started saving while still leaving yourself a little bit of cushion on the sidelines. Mm, that's a good point. So I actually was building an emergency fund sort of while saving for retirement. <laughs> right. But look, you know, typically in a Roth IRA, that's invested aggressively and you don't have that money in cash. So that's one of the biggest benefits of the emergency fund is you're not making a ton of money with it sitting around, but you also know that that money is going to be there and it's not going to fluctuate or drop below the amount you put in. Amazing. So we've talked about fees, uh, you know, that financial advisors charge or how they might charge. Can you talk specifically now, maybe not about what Nicole and I, how our fee structure is with you, because that was five years ago and, and times have changed. But can you talk about right now, if you were to take on a new client, what your fees or requirements would be? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, as I described earlier, right now we operate on an assets under management fee structure. And on the first $2 million that's invested on our firm, you pay 1% of that. So let's use the example. You have a million dollars that's invested. The fee would be $10,000 per year as your advisory fee. That's charged on a quarterly basis directly from the investment account itself. So you're not writing a check or putting it on your credit card. 
and it's charged on a quarterly basis in arrears. So all that means is for the work that's done January, February, March, we look at the account balance at the end of March, take 0.25% of that, you know, the 1% divided by four, and that comes out at the beginning of April to pay for those first three months worth of the advisory fees. So that's on the asset under management fee, back to the all-in costs, right, of thinking through what that would look like. For the majority of our clients' portfolios, they're invested in pooled investments like ETFs and mutual funds. You know, in some instances, it's individual stocks or individual bonds. But the average portfolio might have expenses. And again, this changes depend on the dollar amount uh, of around 0.2 to 0.4% for the expense ratios. And then the trading costs, depending on you know, what type of year it is, how much volatility there are, typically minimal and a small percentage of the account where it doesn't become that meaningful. So when you think of the all-in costs at our firm, it's a combination of that assets under management fee, the expense ratios for the investments that are in there, and any of those trading costs that are involved. That's on the fee side. On the minimum side, typically it is for a private client space, $1 million and up of investable assets that you need to work with our firm. Some firms have 500,000. Some firms have a bit of a looser interpretation of that initial upfront minimum that you would need to have, where if you have the capacity to save or you think you know you might be selling a company or inheriting money down the road that you could still be brought on as a client with that opportunity to grow the relationship over time. I just have to ask, if you have $2 million or more with your company, what are the fees there? Just asking for a friend. <laughs> no, it does keep going uh, a little bit further <laughs> down. I'll have to pull it up there, right in front yeah, of you. Yeah, get that going. chart up here. I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know how we can get to 10 basis points maybe. <laughs> there you go. That's also going to be a common theme as you look across various companies that you might be hiring is typically the costs do go down like that the more money that you do have. Uh, I'm waiting. I'm not moving on until we get to the, to where to where you guys stop counting. <laughs> when we came to you, we had under fifty thousand dollars to invest with you, and you took us on as not really managing it and just putting it in index funds and keeping an eye on it. Do you? And I know you now work with clients where they have a million dollars of assets under management or, or more. Do you or your company? Do they take people with less than fifty thousand, or is there any sort of situation like that that we had where you would just put it in an index fund, or do you not deal with that at all? Yeah, there isn't. You know, what we haven't spoken through yet is just the evolution again of going from Gerstein Fisher to People's United Bank, where their wealth management division was People's United Advisors, where we sit at now. By the end of the year, uh, now People's United Bank is in the process of being acquired by M and T Bank. And M&T Bank is you know, coincidentally headquartered out of Buffalo, New York, where I'm from. And they have a wealth management division that they acquired around 10 years ago called Wilmington Trust. So Wilmington Trust is going to be the umbrella that will fall underneath for working with clients. Typically, their minimum is between $1 to $3 million of working with clients, but they do have an area called Signature Services, which does cater towards those account balances that you were referring to. So there is still a way to work with that firm in the future, even if you don't necessarily have that threshold that you were referring to. Got it. Okay. This is Artistic Finance asking the, the questions that everyone's dying to know. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm a Koch go. brother, the living Koch brother, you know, should I switch to Matt Queller? Well, we're going to find out. <laughs> All right. I have it pulled up here. We're going to have to go back here and make sure that your listeners have the correct fee schedule because this has changed for us recently. But on the initial $2 million, again, coming in as a new client, it's 1% of the assets under management is that advisory fee. The next $3 million is at 0.70%. And then on the next $15 million, we're at half a percent. And for additional amounts over $20 million, that gets you as low as 0.35% to go by the books here off of our advisory agreement. Okay. All right. Hashtag goals. We need $20 million to get our cost basis down to 35 basis points. <laughs> there you go. And look, I mean, I would say 
when you're thinking about those fees, obviously important to you know and should be a big piece of the puzzle, uh, but I don't think should be the end-all be-all decision maker that you always want to go with the lowest cost option, right? When you're hiring an advisor, because a lot of times those higher fees do include a lot of great services that may even ultimately end up paying for some, themselves and then some down the road. Yeah. And, and I would say, you know, we have you as an advisor. Really, it's you that we like because the companies that you've worked for have gone through three different names. We didn't even realize they were changing. <laughs> and so for us, like one of the pros with working with you is that we like you and you sort of get us understand us. Um, and really the fee, yeah, the free structure, the fee structure at whatever the company you're going to be at is going to be what it's going to be. But you know, we're there for you just because you're, you're our, you're our guy, you're our advisor. <laughs> oh, love to hear that. And thank you for that. And, you know, down the road, that's always something that should be part of the conversation. And if there ever are any changes, you know, we're having initial discussions with the folks on the other side at Wilmington Trust and M&T Bank, uh, learning, you know, what their fee structure is going to be and what that looks like for our clients and communicating that down the road. But, you know, any client always would need to opt into any new, type of fee arrangement that might be changing or different than the one that they would already have. Yeah. Um, so do you think that having a one-time meeting with an advisor is worthwhile? And if so, how much would it cost for somebody to just do a one-off to sort of set up their plan? Yeah, look, I think everybody can benefit from that initial discussion, especially if you don't necessarily have a lot of that expertise yourself. When you have that initial meeting with the advisor, doing as much of that prep work Upfront can be really helpful, especially if they're charging on an hourly rate. So, you know, I've seen prices anywhere from, say, $200 to $500 per hour for that type of consultation. Again, it's going to vary depending on your geographic region. And then if you did want a one-time financial plan put together, those get a little bit more expensive depending on how comprehensive that is and how much you have going on in your situation. But that could range, say, from $1,000 to $3,000 or so, just to give your listeners a rough sense of what that one-time financial plan might cost. Okay. Do you ever do one-offs yourself? We don't typically do that as part of our ongoing assets under management fee that we charge. That is putting together you know, that plan for our investors and our clients and you know, speaking to them about those types of arrangements. So it can happen, but typically it's looped into part of a, a bigger relationship. Now, you've alluded to this before, searching on WebMD to find the solutions to your health problems. <laughs> I am a big proponent of, you know, just research anything. We have the internet. We can find the answer mm -hmm. to any question. Now, there, of course, is the caveat that we don't always know what questions we should be asking. But I always think if I have a question, I go online, and within five minutes, I can have a roughly good answer, or I can know that I need to do more research. I'm just wondering from your case, being a certified financial planner, do you think you're, <laughs> it's better to have you or could somebody just go online and get all the answers themselves and sort of do what you do just, but do it on their own? What's your thoughts? Yeah. Lay up question for me, Ethan. me every time. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, look, I think, you know, I'm the type of person that would also be upfront and transparent and really tell you if I think that it's a good fit and you would really benefit from working with me. Or, you know, there's been many circumstances where I've told clients that you'd be better off, you know, going in using either a digital advice solution. You know, there's times where I still recommend Vanguard or a company like Betterment that charges just a small fee for, you know, ongoing investment management if they don't have more of those complexities in their life. So I do think it's a large part of the advisor's responsibility too of letting the clients know whether or not they think that they would fit in well with the type of model and the expertise that that advisor has. But you know, in those situations where I do think it does make sense for someone to work with me, what I play up is really my years of experience, you know, the technical expertise that I have and the accountability that I'll provide of keeping you on track with your goals and your investments. And then, you know, I think I'm great at, at doing all of those things, but it's also that network of professionals for other things that I don't do myself that I could refer you to that I know have done great work for my clients, whether that's helping them out with life insurance or disability insurance, helping them put together a basic will or a trust structure, you know, helping make sure that they get good advice about, you know, long-term care or, you know, other types of medical decisions that come up around 
retirees and what they have to think through. So, you know, when you spend all this time looking for an advisor, well, you'd also have to spend that time looking for all those other professionals to work with. But if your advisor already has built up a great network of other trusted professionals to refer you out to, that's extremely valuable to have. Yeah. And actually, now I'm thinking of all the things you've helped us with in the past. At one point, we decided we needed a will, or maybe you guys told us we needed a will. <laughs> and also that thing, the health thing where, you know, if you're in a coma, what should you do? Mm-hmm. I remember you guys said, oh, you can use this attorney or this attorney. Here you go. We'll introduce you. Right. So you also did that for us, which I didn't even realize I forgot. That's that's part of what you guys have helped us with. Yeah. And look, you know, times are changing, too. I talked about earlier in the podcast how the industry is evolving. Before, there used to be really strict rules out there about what you could post online about an advisor. So rules have changed recently. I think we're going to be seeing a lot of companies pop up in this space and websites that you know become really good at doing this. But before, it was really difficult to leave an advisor review or an endorsement. Now, you have broker check like we spoke through where you could look that up, but to really have a client endorsement or have you know the Yelp of financial advisors, there's a few companies that are doing this now, but that's now allowed. Right. So you're going to be able to go out there and read about different people's experiences working with an advisor, whether that was positive or a negative. So when you do go to look online to decide whether or not you want to work with somebody, you'll hopefully be able to make a lot more of an informed decision instead of just relying on your own research or a word of mouth endorsement. Amazing. Okay. So, Matt, I can't thank you enough for joining us here today. And I have one more question, one more topic before we start to wrap things up. When we talk about artists, because that's who listens to this, and again, artists are people, so we're no different in that sense, and money is the same regardless of whether you're an artist or not an artist, but are there specific considerations that artists should be thinking about when it comes to their finances, you know, different than if somebody has a steady paycheck? (laughs) Yeah, look, there's three main ones that I'll talk through that I think, you know, are top of mind and can add the most value for artists specifically. So the first one we've already spent a little bit of time talking through, and that's that cash flow planning component, right? Because artists have cash flows a lot of time that isn't linear, and it could be paid on a contract basis or a project basis. So really doing the upfront work to you know build that emergency fund that we talk about is extremely important when you have that lumpiness and the cash flow coming in. Uh, helping to smooth that out and give you more flexibility to say, take on a longer term project that you might not see payoffs for in the beginning, or really structure out what your savings might be based on what you have in the bank today that still allows you to live the type of lifestyle that you want. So, trying to put numbers and timing behind the cash flow piece is extremely important while also doing your best to still save regularly and trying to automate as much of that as possible, just knowing that. If you had to rely on, you know, paycheck to paycheck, it would be a lot more difficult to put that money towards your goals. Another huge component, and this is a combination of the advisor partnering with the accountant, but still having an advisor that's really informed and can help you out with this is the tax planning component of an artist's compensation. So, you know, am I doing a great job tracking your expenses and using that in a way based on every allowable deduction to offset your income or profit that you might have. Now, having artists think through their business structure to make sure that they're both protected from a liability standpoint, as well as incorporated in the best way possible for their income for various types of retirement account structures or savings from payroll taxes or social security taxes. So start thinking through things like LLCs or S-corps or sole props are all good conversations that artists should have with the accountant or an advisor to figure out what is that best structure going to be for them. And, you know, I've seen cases where we've helped clients do this and set them up in a way that allows them to have a certain type of retirement account that has significant tax savings. You know, we're talking thousands of dollars or in some cases, tens of thousands of dollars, just based on that one little switch that they made to the type of entity that they're set up as. That flows you know, directly into the next one, which is that retirement planning component for artists. So thinking through, number one, am I even saving for my retirement? Because a lot of the artists may not have that benefit of a more traditional workplace retirement savings plan, like a 401k, or even that added benefit of the employer match that we had spoken about at the beginning of the podcast. So for artists, you know, the traditional IRA or the Roth IRA option is always available. 
depending on the type of income source that's coming in and the way that they're incorporated, they could potentially be saving into what's called a SEP IRA based on that 1099 income that they might have. Maybe they've set up an individual 401k if they're the only employee and they want to have higher limits of what they're able to put into the account. So not only can that advisor help them determine what's the right type of account structure, but then also based on the income that they have coming in, how much is the right amount to be saving based on what they can afford and also something that allows them to meet their goals of retiring based on when they'd like to retire on what they have saved today and where they'd ultimately like to be down the road. So Matt, again, thank you. Just a few more questions as we wrap up here. What advice would you give yourself back when you yourself started building your finances? Yeah, I really thought long and hard about this one. And look, I think now looking back would be great if I could read that. But I think a lot of the advice that I'd be giving myself, I may have heard before, but didn't necessarily follow through as much as I would have liked to or could have benefited even more if I did. But first and foremost, saving early and saving often is one of the biggest ones. And I think, you know, something that can really set yourself up for success. You know, I've read all the studies and try to educate my clients about you know, some of the things that you spoke about too of, you know, say a 18 year old, how much they would need to save to have a million dollars at the same rate of return versus a 40 year old who's saving, you know, a different amount at the same rate of return and they're significantly different dollar amounts. So, you know, the earlier you start, the more time you have for that money to compound and grow on top of itself to become an even larger amount down the road. So savings huge. Communication is definitely big. You know, the earlier and the more often that you can open up to either a partner or a family member about what you're doing and making sure that you're on the same page is great advice. And I think, you know, regardless of your age is something that anybody could benefit from. Next is having structure around the check-ins that you're doing. So I spoke about the quarterly ones that I have with my wife. You know, we just started doing that more recently, but I'm sure would have benefited from that even earlier on in our relationship of making sure that we looked at where we were, how we were tracking towards our goals and seeing if there were other adjustments or tweaks that we could have made. And then last but not least, and again, one of the most important ones is what you were first speaking about when you were doing your own research online is educating yourself, right? So whether that's reading books, reading blogs, following people on Twitter, listening to the Artistic Finance podcast, you know, the more informed you are, the better decisions that you're going to be making. And these are things that can only help you down the road, both for your own personal finances, but then, you know, also being there as, you know, someone who can also be leaned on for helping other people with that advice down the road. I think that is all, all of those, that's four great points, especially the one about listening to artistic finance. <laughs> that, that should be number one. The one about doing the annual meeting with your partner and going over the net worth and the finances, that is so important is like talking about it. And, and actually, hence this whole show, which is we're talking about it. Like we have to talk about these things. Exactly, get the conversation going. Yeah, again, Nicole, if you're listening, we are gonna have to start doing it annually <laughs> and maybe the quarterly. I mean, if we can get to quarterly, I mean, what that's not going to hurt us. I, re I really like that one. I think it's so important to talk about it. Is there a book or resource that you can recommend to people to get them on a good, solid financial foundation? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, I've always enjoyed reading through personal finance books. And my dad's a psychologist and that aspect of finance has always really interested me as well, since you know so much of money is related to people's emotions and just their thoughts around money and the decisions that they make. So this recommendation that I have is, you know, based on you know lessons from a behavioral finance expert named Brian Portnoy, and the book is called The Geometry of Wealth: How to Shape a Life of Money and Meaning. And this one is a fantastic read. Can't recommend this highly enough. You know, any one of my friends that comes to me and is just getting started with investing, this is the book that I direct them towards. Not necessarily for all the technical knowledge that they'll get about investing, even though it does have some of that in there, but more so starting with more of that philosophical question that we spoke about in the beginning of the podcast of what do you want your money doing for you? So the key theme of this book is what the author calls funded contentment. Or how do you underwrite or pay for those things in your life that are going to make you happy and fulfilled? So look, you you know knocked it out of the park from this stock tip that you got. Well, great, you just made ten thousand dollars from it, but how's that ten thousand dollars going to improve your life and 
if you also could have lost all of that money on there and you have a family and you need to pay for college, you know, do you really want to be trying to knock it out of the park with all those investments or would more of a safe, steady type of return work better for you in your situation? So those are a lot of the big takeaways from the book. And again, a great foundation for someone just getting started out with investing and now focusing more on their personal finances to check out. Fantastic. I love that. All right, Matt, where can people connect with you? Yeah, so I'd say the best way would be just to find me on LinkedIn. So Matthew Queller, last name's K-W-E-L-L-E-R. And also, you know, if anybody is interested in connecting with me for their own personal situation, we are taking on clients. You can email me on my work email at matthew.queller at peoples.com. Or give me a call on my work cell phone at 917-301-8139. Okay. And also, if anybody wants, just reach out to me and I'll give you Matt's personal cell phone. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> kidding. Kidding. But seriously, kidding. Um, Matt, uh, I cannot thank you enough for doing this. You just laid out so much good financial knowledge. And I, I think if anybody's thinking about, should I have a financial advisor? Should I not have one? You just gave us every possible reason, pro or con. So thank you so much for taking three hours out of your vacation to to meet with me and do this. Yeah, it was my pleasure, Ethan. Really enjoyed being on. And look, I think there's a ton of great info for people to learn about an industry where people a lot of times may have been turned off by even having that initial conversation with the financial advisor. So hope that I you know brought some people over to see the light and looking forward to to hearing this come out. All right, folks, that's all I have for this week's episode. One thing Matt forgot to mention, he runs an Instagram account, at DoorsNY, which posts beautiful photos of doors and doorways in New York. If you're feeling like sharing the love, go give it a follow at DoorsNY. That's D-O-O-R-S-N-Y. My only takeaway from today's show is a bit of financial homework. That is for you to create one of these four actions to prepare for meeting with a financial advisor. Write down your financial goals, which is easier said than done, but write something down. Create a budget of your actual income and expenses each month. This is to figure out what you can invest each month with a financial advisor or on your own. Create a net worth statement to get a current snapshot of your actual finances. And finally, prepare a list of questions for an advisor. Your homework is to do one of those four things. If you need instructions for creating a budget or net worth statement or help creating goals or coming up with questions for an advisor, there are links in the show notes for that. And I have the links in the show notes for both episodes. The links are also at artisticfinance.com. Is a financial advisor right for you? I'm a big proponent of doing things yourself especially when it comes to retirement savings because it boils down to dollar cost averaging into total stock market index funds. Anyone can do that on their own, especially with robo-advisors and auto deposits. But I also acknowledge that professionals who devote their focus to something tend to do a better job than I ever would. So while I encourage you to take control of your financial life, I myself have a financial advisor. And as we all know, actions speak louder than words. After listening to these two episodes, you should have more than enough information to decide if you should get in contact with an advisor or double down on your own financial education. If you liked this concoction of two episodes and want to tip your bartender, please consider becoming a patron for $3 a month or more. You will get a private audio feed that includes early releases of episodes and the outtakes from each show. And remember... If you aren't ready to become a patron but you want to hear the outtakes from a show, email me directly at artisticfinancepodcast at gmail.com and I'll share those with you directly and for free. If you are ready to support us, sign up at patreon.com slash artisticfinance and thank you a thousand times. And the last thing, if you live in New York City and you want to see a play this week, I'm lighting one at the Flea Theater in Tribeca. It's called Merry Murder F. It's a 90-minute comedy with some ballroom dancing peppered in. The cast includes Gary Wolf, Audrey Rose Young, Candace Kaplan, and Ronnie Dutra, and is directed by Kim St. Leon. I will be in attendance this Friday, September 24th. If you can't make it then, the show runs to October 3rd. Find a link for tickets in the show notes, and I hope to see you there. 
That's it for today. Until next time, break a leg. Thank you for listening to Artistic Finance. Make sure to subscribe. To access our show notes, transcripts, or resources, go to artisticfinance.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decision, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by Artistic Finance. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.